Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Fergus Dolan. Delighted to have you here today for our webinar on Health Literacy is the Best Medicine. Uh, Helen Ryan, my colleague, will be facilitating today. Hi, Helen. Hi, Fergus. And my colleague, Ethan Mulhall, is helping us as well. So Hi, um, I'll hand you over to Helen to get going. Great. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm delighted to be with you for uh, this session this afternoon. Uh, as Fergus said, I'm happy as I go through um, the couple of slides that I have. If you have any questions, please put them into the chat box. And there'll also be an opportunity at the end where we can um, people can unmute and ask that question as well. Um, so I'm going to spend sort of uh, the time that I have with you looking at this in three different chunks. So a little bit of information to start with, what is health literacy, numeracy and digital literacy. Um, it, it is another angle to the whole experience at the minute for all of us, but in particularly in the health sector. Then I'm going to move into delivering a literacy friendly service and sharing with you some standards, um, tell you a little bit about pharmacy program we're working on. And then finally, I suppose the real practical piece for today are these tips on communicating more effectively, hopefully, and I have a couple of resources and some takeaways. Um, it is a very, I am condensing what we would normally do in about three, three and a half hours into uh, an hour today. So please bear with us. There's a lot of information. We will send you the slides. We will send you the recording to share with your colleagues as well. And I'm very happy to take any questions by email after this as well, because there is a, a lot of information. Um, so that's, that's, good. that's uh, fine. Right. So literacy, numeracy and digital skills in everyday life. Um, what? do we mean you know and this visual is quite um it, it's very useful for us to try and explain this because for many of us and, and most of us here today are probably privileged and honored enough to have fluent reading writing uh numbers if we're, we're good with the numbers technology um for many of us now we've just had to get used to you know our mobile phones or using the internet and with work and emails and whatever and there are skills that we use in every part of our day in our life so sometimes when people say what i don't um i don't use literacy well we do from the very thing of waking up in the morning which is numeracy the alarm clock right through to the whole day um within our family our work our health and well-being and social and community we're using these skills and i suppose it's not just about those mere technical skills, it is also a, a bigger than that because a lot of where literacy needs and issues come in is a lot about people's own self-confidence, self-esteem, um, and how do we use these in different contexts and, and different spaces. So again, the outer circle there, you'd see where we use these in perhaps public services, going into a hospital today, if we to fill in a form, if I was voting in an election uh, in my workplace, to do with farming and agriculture it's their food a huge one food labels we're reading um, the back of those again the climate environment and finally in our social and community uh, life as well so i suppose it's just it's we just want to set literacy in a space for everybody to understand that there are skills that all of us are using every day of our lives and what we're looking at today, obviously, is around the health literacy and numeracy, um, and indeed, we'll be looking at digital literacy as well. And we look at health literacy and numeracy as one coin, two sides. So for many, many years, health literacy, when we spoke about it, was all about the person. So how are Helen's skills when I go into that hospital appointment later on today? And am I able to um, engage with the information? Can I fill in the form? Um, can I confidently speak with my um, healthcare practitioner. Um, and it is about that. It is about my skills going into a health appointment. But it's not just about that. It's about when I arrive at the hospital later on, imagine I'm going there this evening, was the hospital well signposted? Did I find the way into the main reception well? Could I make my way around the hospital? When I got there, was it easy to communicate with the person, um, get into my appointment? Uh, talk and plain English, all of the things were, that we're going to look at. So it is not just about me and my skills and the person, it's also about health services and how they deliver, uh, and we'll be looking at this in a literacy friendly way. Health numeracy, so that's a really new term that um, wasn't maybe there previously, it's all, if you look at the research, it's a lot of it is about health literacy, but health numeracy, and, and you've got to love the Americans for this, they've done a lot of work on, on this area, really is exactly as it sounds, it's about the numbers that we need to work around our health um, issues. 
So it is a term now that is up there with, and we, we name it because if we don't name it, it can sometimes get forgotten. So uh, what I suppose that specifically means is health numeracy is about understanding things like calculations, information and documents. And look at that example there, a real obvious one. That's a, for many people who work in pharmacies would know that, a, a medicine label. Um, again, quite gobbledygook when we look, uh, I do other work with pharmacists and we would explore this from a plain English perspective. It's written in capital letters, so it's sort of shouting at me. Um, people are looking at it there. It's, it's, it's actually quite bland, isn't it? It's all in the same text. It's quite hard to read and understand. So that would be a health numeracy thing would be trying to work out what is the instruction in, in that. And it can be very challenging for people. There's also some research that says that, you know, in the UK, 46% of people got the answer wrong when they were asked that question of, you know, the one in 10, one in 100, one in 1,000. And I would grapple. I'd have to sit down and get a pen and paper. I'm quite a, uh, you know, I, I, I'm okay with numbers, but I would need to think about answering that question. And if I shot from the hip, I might be one of those 46% of people who would get it wrong. Um, they also linked that people with poor numeracy skills are less likely to take a bowel cancer screening test and there's other um, impacts. We'll have a look at that later. So it is, it really is a, a, an important one to, to not um, forget that numeracy is, is a huge part of um, this space as well. We have digital health literacy and in fact I only had, um, I was speaking to um, a person working in health promotion from the HSE yesterday who reminded me of this so I would have said it but I said no I'm going to go back now and have a look um, and uh, just put something in specifically on this because with the health services having changed radically really in the last year with COVID um, there has been an increased use of things like telemedicine, telehealth um, the e-health, the m-health, the mobile health and, and things like wearables and so on. Um, I should have asked you there to throw in that stat, I for, I've forgotten my thing, but the, the what do people think, I don't know if people are surprised with that statistic there, that 42% of Irish adults struggle with some, you know, basic digital tasks around looking up a website, sending an email um, and for anyone that I work with Tala Hospital a little bit, we've done a, a good bit of work with them. They have screens, touch screens when you arrive in there. And of course, pre-COVID, it was lovely. They had really great volunteers who would help you. Um, and uh, maybe they're still there, but obviously there's a lot of restrictions now. And they would actually help you to fill in the information in the touch screen that printed out a little piece of paper to get you to your appointment in the hospital. So there's, there's technology is just coming at us in all angles, whether it's the actual appointment itself or engaging online with our health. And really these are our two challenges here. We need to look at how do we embed that health literacy approach to digital health? I would say to anyone today, perhaps that's on the call, if you're working on any digital health projects, please remember the health literacy angle to that. So people were quite concerned that, I know over the years I spoke to people about the e-health records. You know, we can't be running off doing things. We, can run off and do them but just to take and embed this approach and be think about people who may struggle and um, with digital skills and literacy skills as well and, and numeracy and then equally as well as making sure that it there's an, a good approach to it we need to build the digital literacy skills for health so if we're expecting people to go online and maybe see their doctor through the internet or um do some work on telemedicine, like perhaps do a, a physio class online. We've got to work with those skills and be conscious of those as well. Helen, could I just interrupt you there? There's yeah. a question there from Maria O'Sullivan, just about the 42% the digital literacy. And she's wondering, do you know, is it age stratified? Uh, yes, well, in, in that's a, a statistic actually from the last adult literacy survey, which is a bit old. It's it's back in 2013, and we'll be looking at other stats in a minute. Um, it, yes, it was mainly in older, but surprisingly, there were a number of young people still in the, you know, that 25 to 34 group that would have struggled. Um, again, it's very linked to low education. So we know a lot of the, the demographics around that. I suppose to surprise you, or would people be surprised, a reason a more recent survey from CDFOP, that's a, a European organization, had Ireland at 55% of people with low digital skills. So we intersperse, I mean, this, which statistic do you use? So it is actually um, um, worse in that sense. And that is, again, mainly over the, you know, it's, it's, it's over the age groups. It's not, 
specifically on um, uh, saying all young people are able to, because Germany, just in the last few months, actually, in January, produced results of their health, their new health literacy survey. And was really surprising was young people were struggling with digital health literacy. Now, a lot more research does need to go into that. And Ireland's own health literacy results are due out in June. So we're very excited to see what that um, brings to us. So it's not as easy as, as I suppose, just saying it has to, it's all the people at the other spectrum. And of course, people are aware we're bombarded with information nowadays. So where do you source true facts, real facts, um, not get swallowed down the misinformation route um, and, and, and fake information. So that's another whole element of the digital health literacy would be critical thinking skills around making sure people um, are finding real evidence and hard facts. Um, so it, it, it's, it is a very interesting area, I think, that we'll be working on for a good bit to come. So thanks for that question. I uh, hope I answered that with a, in a roundabout way, but there's a, a couple of angles to it. Right. So what really we're looking at around improving, so it's health literacy, numeracy and digital literacy. I'm, I'm putting all of these three skills in with the health here. Really, it's getting us from this sort of muddled space. I mean, really, this diagram is just to show us it's, it's, it's quite obvious enough, but it's this all of these questions thrown around, trying to understand about whether it's vaccination, going for my mammogram, um, how much should I, sugar should I be taking, what exercise, all of those sort of pieces to do with our health and decisions and turning it into, I understand what I'm reading, I know what I need to do to be healthy, I'm able to make the decisions that I need to, um, and to just generally move us from that sort of befuddled space into a more empowered space. And that really, we need the two angles, which we've spoken about. We need the services to be delivering um, what they do in a better and more health literacy friendly way. And then we ourselves need to be upskilled around that as well. So I'm going to introduce you to a lovely gentleman now called Michael. So I have interviewed Michael a little while ago. It's about six minutes. And uh, my, I've asked Michael very specific questions about health literacy that I hope will give you an insight uh, into um, it from a perspective of an individual. Michael is, is great. He speaks a lot at our events. He went back to learn to read um, at 57. And he talks about uh, how health literacy has been um, for him over the years. Hello, Michael. Lovely to have you with us today. Thank you. Hello, Helen. And it's, it's, uh, it's an honour. It's a great privilege to be here and give, giving my story to you. I, was, I started back, I couldn't read until I was the age of 57. And it, when I started to read and read books and things like that, it changed my life. It was a big step going back from being dodging and jumping around for, for 57 years before I took the jump and went back in. But look, at, I'm happy. I'm happy where I am now. And I'm, I've done level threes, level fours. I've got distinctions in level four QQI. And I'm happy as, I'm, as I am. Great. And Michael, just interested to talk today around um, dealing with health services and how you would have found that, uh, you know, whether it's the pharmacist, the nurse, or the doctor, how how did you find that? In some some health services was they were they weren't just consistently the same. But I found health services there was a lot of bureaucracy. There was a lot a lot of forms. Like I mean, you get you get a form in that came in, where especially a social welfare form, and all kinds of things to be filled in on it. Yeah. That was I found that difficult. So I found that quite difficult. Another thing was when you go to the pharmacist and you, you had this prescription that the doctor wrote out and uh, I'm sure the doctor uh, there once said it used to write in it, well, I don't think anyone could read the prescription. That would take a high degree of qualification to read their prescription. But it would say you hand it in, the pharmacist give you out the medication, something like that, and take one every every three hours and one uh, before meals and one after meals and all like that. There was an awful lot of reading to be done on things like that. And I found, I found that quite difficult until some of the, uh, some of them was brilliant. Well, what they done was, in one case was, we well, said there was a blue tablet, there was a red tablet, there was a yellow tablet. You take the blue tablet with a glass of water at, at lunchtime, you take the red tablet and like that. Things like that was a great help. But in the initial stages, like I mean, I found it quite difficult actually. So that's, that's really my spirit. 
That's, and that's a great example that you give there as well, Michael, around uh, how a sort of a pharmacist there was supporting you. Are there any other tips you would have for health practitioners when they're dealing with people and you're not sure if they may have some literacy uh, needs or indeed if they to fill in a form? What, what would you suggest that the health practitioner can do to make uh, that easier for the person? I'd, I'd suggest that... <coughs> Talk more to the person, be able to read the person's like, I mean, body movements, whether, the, whether, the, whether they're confident they're lifting up the form and they're looking at it. If they're looking at it too long, that's, that's a bad sign, like, I mean, because they should be fit to read her. Because, and, some of the, and some of the actually forms that the health service, the health practitioners give you, there's too much information on it. Mm -hmm. And you're reading, like, I mean, a mile of stuff like that where you don't need to. If you have a particular illness, like I mean, or a particular case, like I mean, it should be only focused on that particular illness rather than a mile of stuff like that that you have to skim and scam down through before you can get actually what you're looking for. Great. And what about questions, Michael? How do you think questions can be dealt with? Uh, questions with, with the pa patient doctor relationship. I think if you get, if you go into a doctor's surgery and uh, they're explaining something to you. Let it be good. Let, well, you, look, at you're going to get, when you go to a doctor's surgery and a doctor's sitting down, you obviously have an illness of some kind. And it can, if you get bad news, like, I mean, or not so good news, it can be a wee bit of a shock to the person. So what I'd say is for the practitioner to talk slowly and explain the, the, what, what exactly is, what exactly that you need to do as a patient to improve your your situation, but also in in the conversation, for the rather than wait for the patient, i.e., me to ask the question, for the doctor or practitioner to say, well, have you a question now about that particular item? And just talk talk slowly, explain, and not just rattle it on like I mean, repeat it, repeat it, go back on it like I mean, go back on little bits, and also talk slowly and get the message across and then when they're finished and all like that bef before the patient leaves the surgery or leaves the consultant room ask them is there anything else you'd like to talk about whereas there might be something else there in the background let them is there something else you'd like to talk about things like that that's really great and i suppose plain english is important as well michael would you think well, uh, uh, yes, plain English is very important, not to be coming out with these medical terms of uh, big long words. You can, you can, the same message can be got across to a person in layman's language, if I want to put it that way, rather than in the, in the, other in the professional language. It's okay talking to professionals that come in in their language because they understand, but an ordinary person come in, and plus a person that has got not so good news from the doctor, they're they're dumbfounded, they're stunned, they're, they're, they're not fit to process the information they're getting. So it has to be delicately done in plain English to them. Like, I mean, short words, pauses, just a little bit of information. Let the person, let the patient digest that inf bit of information. Then another bit of information, let them digest it. And in between each piece, it says the patient, like, I mean, is there anything you'd like to ask me with that particular piece? wait for a few moments, don't just keep moving on, just wait for a few moments, because that person that got that news is digesting it, they're in shock and they're in upset or whatever. So that's my take on it. Great. Well, Michael, that was really um, great to get that information and thank you so much for your time today. No problem, uh, no problem. And the, the best of luck, have a good day. And you too. Hello, Michael. Great. So I hope um, people found that interesting um michael is a, a great advocate for us and again and he, you've heard a bit of what he was saying there he gave a little bit of tips away we'll be looking at those further down the line about speaking clearly and in plain english um but again any questions people have please feel free um so i'm going to test your knowledge now so i'm going to ask people to um maybe have a a, a punt here and stick a figure in if people would i'm asking you what do you think are the statistics of the number of people who would struggle with sort of basic text? It's called level one. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Anyone like to say what 
or that you can say what percentage or you have it there we've won in thing for struggling with literacy anyone want to throw a um so one in five okay Murray just thrown in one in five one in six one in four okay eight so it's great so people are thinking around the sort of between three and eight so look you're hitting in well there great okay you all know your stuff here before i even begin to do this okay we'll switch over to numeracy now so it's a, for anyone sandra's just giving us one in five or sanka there one in five so numeracy do you think it's higher or lower what would you guess it would be the numeracy statistic again you one in or you can give us a throughout a percentage people think higher one in three so i'm thinking it's a bit lower higher okay yeah so we're going up Okay, interesting. So I'll be going to share with you now, this is again, I've mentioned the survey earlier on, it's an adult literacy survey from, it was 2013, um, where the results came out in 2013, it was done in 20, um, uh, over 2011, 2012. So would it surprise you to find out, so well done everyone on your one in six, you were you were ahead of that and maybe you maybe you've heard that statistic hopefully in some of our awareness work we would um we would promote that so one in six which is equal to 18 percent of irish adults so it's only people between the ages of 16 and 65 so that's a, a bit it, it's not good that the survey ends at 65 we so we've no statistics for anyone 65 and over so you can imagine if we were to add people in there it could be higher um, so it's 18%, which is just over half a million people um, will struggle with um, basic information, reading a health leaflet, maybe understanding a letter that might come about a hospital appointment. And for numbers, it is, uh, it is greater. And this was the first time we ever had a numeracy statistic. We never had one before that for Ireland. And we have 25%. So that's one in four. So people got that. They were guessing um, higher. They were correct, uh, which is nearly three quarters of a million people are going to struggle with um so leave it even take it from a, a you know we've working out a discount or dividing up a bill if we're out socially but in the medical and the health world that means you know that one in four adults will struggle maybe with working out their medication when they get home from the chemist and um, so it's a, it is a huge um a huge number of people and we need to to work on this and and, and do more Ireland then is just placed 17th in literacy and 18th in numeracy again from the same survey just in case um people are, are interested in that now, what does this, you may say, say, what does level one mean? Give me an example of this. So here's two examples from the previous, um, the first survey and, and the previous one before that. So the one there, the, the label that again, all of us that are fluent readers, if we were asked, if we were in a shop or that was on the back of a, a yogurt pot, what is the, uh, you know, how much sugar is in that pot? None of us would read it. We would use that skill that we're all so familiar with, which is scanning. And we would just scan down until we found sugars up oh, one gram and we would answer it like that. Similarly, with the other question, it's a longer and a larger piece of text, but it's from an everyday aspirin packet. And if you said to somebody, what is the maximum number of days that a person should take this medicine? Again, we wouldn't read it. We would scan it and we would be on, oh, there's dosage grand. But for people who are not fluent, they will read every single word. So by the time you're on there, the oral C1 to or two tablets every six hours, preferably accompanied. That's very, that's jargon. That's, I'm actually find it hard to even say that um, by food for not long. Sure, I've forgotten what's before that. So um, in that particular aspirin package that was done in 1997, one in four people got that answer incorrect. So we, we have a problem with the way things are written as well, because it isn't as plain English as it could be, but it, they're just interesting examples to show people um, what we mean. So the results, where do they place us? Again, we, we don't have time to go into this in great depth, but I know some people are often interested. So here we are here, just under the, below the average there, around many of our English speaking countries, Canada, England, ourselves, um, and one of our, the, the, you'll see there, some of the other countries that are ahead. Um, again, if we were together in a room doing this, we would explore this a little bit more and I'd be testing all your geography. Um, but it's just, it is interesting to see where we are and we will be participating, Ireland will be in the next survey in 2023. And fingers crossed that we will hopefully be a, a bit better and our, our literacy levels will be a bit higher in, in that survey. We do have a health literacy survey. So again, this is really interesting thing to note. So back in, again, around the same time, they looked at, uh, at health literacy and we're there under IE, see us there, that's Ireland, eight countries. And we have 10% at inadequate and uh, another nearly 30% at problematic. And when you add them together, it's a limited health literacy rate. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that today for any of you here that are working in GP practices or in hospitals or in primary care centers or wherever you are, that four out of 10 people that you may have worked with today may struggle with some of the information you may hand them. So if you're giving them a health leaflet after you've engaged with them or you send them an email um, or you're speaking to them even and you're trying to give them instructions, four out of 10 people may struggle um, with that. So it's just, it's a really, a, a really good alert thing for us all to know. The good news is we have a new survey that has just been completed last year and the results take much quicker to come out. So these are due out in June. They're with the Department of Health and um, on the minister's desk fairly soon. So we're really interested to see how Ireland is now. And it was done during COVID. So that'll be, um, watch out for those um, statistics in June. We'll be running webinars and stuff to, to look at that then. Any, if anyone has any questions, again, as I say, look, feel free to, to ask me that. So finally, rounding that off, I mean, again, it's just for con context to say that, you know, low health literacy, it, it's costing everyone money. Um, and this is the type of argument I use and, and we use in NALA when we go in to meet our politicians, be it the Minister for Health, the Minister for um, Further and Higher Education. We say, you know, you need to invest in literacy and health literacy. And why? Well, when you invest in it, first of all, you're helping people become more confident and, and healthier. There's evidence there. Um, and second, it's better for so the individual, it's better for society and it's better for our health services. Um, so it really is a, a key in investment, we feel. And why, I uh, say, is this important? And the, the data and the research that is there, again, the Americans have done, American academics have done a lot of work on this, and there's a lot of, of research around it. But we know that people who have limited literacy and numeracy skills are not turning up for screening. They're presenting at later stages of wh where they're ill and further down the line. They therefore then have to be possibly hospitalized more they're not maybe understanding their treatment, they're not taking their medication properly, and in general, they're recording poorer overall health. And it is, they've even traced that to people with limited literacy and numeracy skills die younger. You know, it's quite a stark, it's the health inequalities piece, and it's not something that we can just say, oh, well, just we leave it there. We need to be more proactive in Ireland to do some work um, on this. We have a little bit of Irish research, so we did get some investment over the years with MSD would have been um, is very strong on health literacy and we've got some research here from 2007. So um, again, you know, one in five people are not fully confident they understand the information they receive. I even can, uh, you know, sometimes I can get a bit confused too and, and I, I, you know, you're, you're adult, the doctor tells you to give your child 10 puffs of the inhaler, you oh great, thank you very much, you run out the door and you forgot, I never asked them why, and I never asked them, do I keep giving them 10 puffs, um, and then it's only when you're around the corner in the pharmacist that I, you say to the pharmacist, they told me to give 10 puffs, what do you do if that doesn't work, you know, and then the pharmacist perhaps can talk to you or you can ring obviously your GP back and check it, so again, I'm part of that 43% would only sometimes ask. In my case, I was, you're just in a tizzy, you know, so it's just, oh my God, I'm running around. What am I doing? Um, it's worrying that 17% of people have taken the wrong dose of medication at least once. Probably not so bad if it's an extra antibiotic that, you know, hopefully won't, um, you know, I'd say won't kill us, but certainly won't do much damage. But if it's really strong um, cancer medication or particularly strong drugs um, that have severe side effects, that is a problem. Um, you know, and again, if you're giving medication to children or if you're a carer for older people, you know, you really we need to be clear that people can understand what they have to give. And then the last one, 66% of people have difficulty understanding signs and directions. I'm hoping that that's getting a bit better and we are working with some of the hospitals around this. So um, I know they're very aware of signage and so on and, and we're doing some work on that. So again, back to our, if anyone wants to throw a, a, a number out there, what percentage do you think when we went out and asked people in 2015 uh, what the word prognosis meant? Do you think, what percentage of people do you think couldn't define that? Anyone want to throw into the chat? 65, there's me, 50, 50. We're probably, yeah, good few. Okay, we're, so a good mixture there. We're going 33, a third right up as far as 85. We're saying, okay, well, look, it's it's 45%. So you're a bit of a, a, a mixture in there. So this the latest research said that, 
you know, um, 45% couldn't define that term. And um, 39% of people are saying, we want less medical jargon. Please speak to us more clearly and, and don't bombard us with uh, technical terms. Um, I, I had my future, I, I thought that the future, the young people were the, going to be the best in asking questions to the health professionals. So it was really interesting to see that people aged 15 to 34 were least likely to ask a doctor, nurse or pharmacist to explain things. Again, we need to tease that out a little bit more. Does that mean they were asking in further research with MSD? They were asking, obviously they were asking Dr. Google and the internet, which isn't, isn't a great place to go unless you're very clear you have a, a good source. But they were asking people like their parents, um, and the, which was good. At least they were going to, a, 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 I suppose, a, a, a hopefully somebody who can then help them with that. And then embarrassment. I mean, this is the key thing. Is it Irish people or is it human nature? we don't really like admitting that we didn't understand what the person said to us. I've done a lot of work with older people in the last number of years and health literacy. And I love older people, um, the way they deal with the health services. Um, lots of them had great examples. And one woman told me, um, met her out in, out in Dunleary, she said, oh, she said, whenever I go in and the doctor starts talking to me and, you know, can't understand, she says, stop there now, doctor, whoever. Um, let's start from the place that I didn't swallow a dictionary for breakfast and now go back and tell me what you were trying to say to me again. Now it was great because it broke the ice, she wasn't aggressive, she wasn't saying whatever but we sometimes and again this is the piece we're here today looking at literacy friendly in a minute but you know we we as individuals have to be asking questions as well as hopefully the health services meeting us um, meeting us with some plain English and easier to understand terms. There is a government commitment. I, I won't spend too long on this, but just to say, we, you know, there is work being done on this. It's in Slauncher Care. It's in Healthy Ireland. You know, we're we're lobbying and we're working as best we can with the health services to try and, you know, develop better responses from the services, and then, all, as I mentioned, in, empower and work with people as well to improve their skills. Okay, so no questions in so far. So we're moving on, please, as I say, put them in as we're going on. We're moving into how do you deliver a literacy friendly service? There's just a couple of slides here and then we we'll move into the real practical side as well. So how do you deliver a literacy friendly service? Well, really it's as simple as you deliver a service that is conscious and takes account of the fact that some of the people that you will have in through your doors or um, you know, in your uh, rooms or in, in wherever you are, that they may have literacy numeracy and digital literacy needs as well. And then that's basically around these four areas we look at now, the communications, staff awareness and responding, policies and procedures and evaluating and improving. And again, we've looked at the evidence here and we've actually mapped a lot of our standards work that I have here to HICWA guidelines. So HICWA have standards, as people are aware, um, uh, for hospitals and for general practices, um, coming into general practices. And we've actually mapped a lot of this work now that we've done. So we've, we've come up with 10 literacy friendly standards. 40% of them are communications, which everyone will probably understand. Yes, that makes sense. Um, from speaking and written information, um, checking people understand, and things like layout is important too of the office. And then two around staff awareness and responding sensitively, three around having policies and ways and, and, and number nine there is a new one. So again, and I um, was working with pharmacies and I didn't have this in before. And he said, you know, we came across staff who didn't, you know, they were a um, bit nervous of their handwriting, a bit embarrassed, so they wouldn't write notes down or they got a new machine into the pharmacy or into the hospital, if that was the case, and they didn't know how to use the new machine because the technical jargon and the guidebooks were very hard. So again, do we support our own staff to improve their literacy, numeracy and digital literacy? And there are, the ETBs are great around the country who can support um, employees who want to return to learning. And then finally, it's sort of, we are evaluating and continually improving is really important. So all of these standards then, we, we've actually developed about 18 for hospitals. Um, we just, we work with different hospitals and, and they come uh, and, and to do that, I don't have them sort of published up there. And those 10 standards came the basis of this crystal clear mark. So this is very interesting and timely because we've just launched actually a, a call for 20 new awards. But basically there are 102 pharmacies around the country that have this mark. So it's got a sticker and it's a certificate. And they got this mark because they went in and they, they answered for us 10 questions based on those 10 standards I showed you a minute ago. And they showed us that they um, gave examples of how they speak clearly, 
of plain English labels, um, examples of how um, they have policies and procedures in place and how they're improving all the time. So again, there's a lot more information on that. I, I won't dwell on it, but I'm happy to answer any questions on that again. Um, Ellen, I'll just interrupt you for one second. There's a question there from Kate Murphy. Can we get a list of the standards on the NALA website or? Um, well, I, I don't think I have, I, they're, they're in our presentations. So certainly when you get this presentation, there's the 10 standards. We can certainly, we should probably, yes, that's a good, thank you, Kate. We must put up a page on our website called Literacy Friendly Standards because these actually apply to, um, they would apply to every service. So I work with local authorities a good bit as well as health service. So yes, we, I will put up these um, 10. And then if somebody wants the hospital standards specifically, they can just email me directly. Um, I'm easy enough, hryan at nala.ie. And we're happy to share them. It's just that again, sort of sticking them up on a website out of nowhere, there wasn't um, the standards aren't up there. And again, I see Mary asked the question there, is there a similar award for other bodies, hospital systems? So Mary, there isn't. There was a similar award for GPs, general practices, when we launched it in 2015. And we only managed to get five GPs to apply because, what? well, they're just so overwhelmed and busy. And there were like more paperwork, more, even though it's not a lot, it's going in and answering 10 questions. The pharmacy just seemed to think, I think maybe it was a, a more of a unique selling point. You know, if my pharmacy had the mark and yours didn't, you might come into mine. The GP practices are like, everyone's in our place, whether we have this or not. We're mad busy. Now we did work with the ICGP and, you know, we would love to have seen more in. And probably if we were working again with the GP practices, I think we need to go out to them and maybe do the audit in a day, deliver a bit of training and meet with the receptionist and the health and the, the nursing staff because the doctor staff just didn't seem, um, you know, it was just really tough to get the time. We don't have an award for hospitals. Mary has them, but I have the standards developed and I've worked with St. Patrick's Mental Health Services on the awards and I worked with UHL um, in Limerick, University Hospitals in Limerick on them. So we've developed them sort of in practice and we'd love to see, I suppose what we did is we mapped them to um, HICWA standards. So we've spoken to HICWA about we, there won't be a separate health literacy standard, but that if we can, anything we do can tick a HICWA standard box that works really well. Um, and we're open, I suppose, as time goes on, we could talk. We don't want to put more paperwork on top of people. It's sort of we're trying to slip all this stuff in to really good practice that is already happening as well. So that's to acknowledge there's a lot of good work happening out there. So I hope that that answers Mary's question there. Um, so that's great. That's the standards and that's the mark. OK, so with this now, we're moving into the very practical piece, too, because I want a chance then for people to, to break out and have a chat. So. Again, what are these tips on communicating more effectively? And I could be here for a whole day giving you these tips. And um, what I'm shrinking it down is into really what I can share with you in this time is four tips. So we wanna look at knowing your audience, assessing health literacy, interesting thing, um, language and plain English. So what is knowing your audience? Well, really that's about who, once you know maybe who you're dealing with, it's really important in how you approach them. So if you're looking to do any more reading on this whole area, one of the biggest gurus in the world on this is Helen Osborne. So it's um, uh, an Osborne with no you. So it's a, if you're, it's sometimes people be like, I can't find her. Now I have, and um, that's her book. Um, her, she has a great website. So it's, it's all linked into this when we send you the presentation. She sends a free e-zine and she's the most interesting podcast. So even in the last week when Fergus sent this out and we've been promoting this with our colleagues, I've had emails in asking me, what about health literacy and people with intellectual disabilities? I had another query in, what about health literacy and people with autism that came in on a, a separate thing coming in? Looking, uh, dementia has become an issue we're hearing a lot about people just in general and health literacy would be an angle for them. So she runs these really interesting podcasts with experts in America. She's an American woman. And there's, there is a lot out there. And I suppose what I like about Helen Osborne is I can nearly always find something around what I'm looking for. And then I can use the world of Google to find other pieces. But in her book, she has a chapter on this. So she says about all of us working with anyone, but in, in the health services, just know who your audience are. And depending on whether it's a young person, whether it's somebody whose English isn't their first language, whether it is somebody with memory loss, um, someone who has hearing, we've visual impairment as well, older adults perhaps spending a bit more time with them, um, and then the autism and intellectual disabilities, disabilities, as I mentioned, we should 
tailor and custom the way we engage with people depending on who they are. And we worked with HICWA about um, four years ago now, four or five years ago, to develop two lovely guides. And I have these um, at the end, there's I have a whole slide and some resources. And we've actually worked with a communications guideline pack that um, looks at some of the issues that you need to consider when you're dealing with people with perhaps some of these um, issues. So again, um, again, people will be familiar perhaps with the intercultural guide that the HSC has produced, really good guide. That's really useful for dealing with people from different cultures. So when we could shake hands, I know we can't now, not every culture likes to shake hands. So it's, it's very, um, you know, simple things like that for us to be aware of. The one that always strikes me here and the one I'll say to everyone just for ourselves is never underestimate, as you know, in the health service, the power and the um, of emotion when it comes to hearing and understanding and taking away information. So any of us, no matter who we are, we think we will be fine with getting test results. Um, we don't often hear what those test results are when we're in a room. Um, we mightn't hear what the doctor is saying to us about um, what we have to do with that medication we're taking. So emotion is a really, it's an interesting one that affects all of us and, and it's one to just be, um, to be aware of. The next slide then is around assessing. So you'd be amazed over the years, the amount of people um, from the medical world who've rung me and said, have you a test I can just give my patient and uh, just to tell me if they um, can, you know, how, how the reading is and how the writing is. So two things. One is I don't know how anyone would have time really to be given a test and checking that out, but this could have been more in a research time. Um, but really, and again, I love the American academics for this. They've looked at this. And they've decided that all you need to know about literacy and numeracy in a health, um, a health meeting or a health um, exchange is, is someone able to read the leaflet that I'm giving them, uh, you know, to go home with? Is someone able to read the consent form I, and understand it that I'm now going to get them to sign? And is someone comfortable, able to sign a, 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 a consent, for example, if, if that's the case. So there's really only two two ways of checking this out. And it's really nice. It's like, um, because all of us might struggle with that. So you just say, if you're handing somebody, let's, let's go with the consent. I'm going in for an operation. Uh, I need to sign a form. So you might say, look, Helen, you're going in now. Um, I need you to read this uh, consent form here and make sure you understand it and sign it would you like me to um, read it out for you? Or are you happy to have a look at it yourself? Great, so if I do, now I, I've actually spoken to a couple of medical people recently who actually have said to me that they don't even ask that anymore now. They will actually, when they're getting people to sign consent in say, I'll tell you what I'll do now, I'll read that out for you. And they've re they read out chunks of it. So you stop, you don't just sit there and read four pages in a row. And after you've read one chunk, now Helen, have you any questions on that? Now that's really good health literacy practice. I understand there are time constraints. You know, we know that people are not all going to be able to do this. But what I would ask health practitioners is use your own judgment as to the people you feel may need this more than others. And if perhaps there's a man and wife in the room and, and they're fine and they put together, maybe they will read it and then sign it for you comfortably. But if someone is on their own and they don't have any support, they may really appreciate you asking that or, or reading it out. And then if you're signing it, you say, look, are you okay with filling out this form here? Or can I give you a hand? You know, so classic case, I had to go get my flu vaccine in the pharmacy. A couple of months ago, I went in and she handed me a form and said, are you okay with that? Filling that out. I said, I am. So I started filling it out. I came to a question and I stopped because and I read the question four or five times. I did not understand. It just was not written in plain English. And it, for me to understand, it was something about if you are under 18, do whatever. So it was just really in a muddle and my head was getting, and she saw me stop because I just, I wasn't moving further than that question. And she said to me, um, are you okay? Well, and I said, I, just, I actually just don't understand this. So I wasn't sure. Oh, she says, everyone's the same. So it must just be an awkwardly written question. She says, just take no. I said, okay, Grant, because I obviously wasn't under 18. But, so it, again, just simple things like that, looking out for them and helping people is really useful. 
what to look out for. So again, what are you just looking out with this in the hospital context or in your in the primary care center in the surgery, you know, uneasy body language, perhaps excuses, you know, I've hurt my hand, I, I forgot my glasses. Now, not everyone who hurt their hand or forgot their glasses has a literacy need, but it may be. Um, and to be aware of that, not filling the form out completely. Um, perhaps a, a, another great one is um, describing your tablet by I take the blue tablets all right, what are they? Well, they're the blue ones. And, you know, so again, maybe people can't understand or read the, the name of the tablet, but they know them by color. Um, and often people have family members and literacy supports, you know, I'll, I'll help my wife looks after that for me um, and different pieces. So that's an important one. Then how do you respond? Well, really the responding. And again, there is such good practice out there. And I've experienced this with my hospital work, with the pharmacy work, that people are really doing their best, you know, to help people understand the information, explaining it clearly, um, offering if you can to help them with the form, um, involving other people in the discussion is good, using visual aids and symbols, that's, that's important. Um, if, if that helps, I know Austin, a great GP in inner city Dublin, he just gets out pictures. He said, he, he just showed, oh, you want me to show you? And he shows you good liver, not so good liver. You know, I need you to stop drinking. Why? Because I don't want your liver to turn out like this. And that was a big moment for the gentleman who he showed those pictures to. He, he went, oh, okay. Right, because again, some of us are visual learners and, and that's an easier way to look at it. And there's a lot of really good work in pharmacists around pill boxes, blister packs, color coding, and some really good stuff there. So I think that there is a lot of, of good practice out there. Watching your language. So again, you know, if we were together now, I'd be throwing these out and asking you to come up with a, a few different terms here. But you know, the, they're words that perhaps you learnt in your medical world, or they're words that you may be used to. But when it comes to ourselves and, and, and the public, you know, what we would like to hear are just, I'll give you that. You know, um, the results are back from your tumour. Um, it is benign. So please use the word if I'm going to hear it which means it is harmless. Now, I, I was queried on that. Benign doesn't necessarily mean harmless. I know there's a whole connotation that can go with that. Um, but just as an example on that one, or if it's malignant, I struggle with that word, it means that um, it is a bit harmful and we're looking at, you know, it depends on, on the severity of, of that. Again, hypertension, the pharmacist said, oh God, you have hypertension, could come out of your mouth. No problem, just say to the person, that means high blood pressure. You know, because again, if you're going to hear it, I don't, it's not that I need to be hidden from these words and these language. I just need them explained to me as, um, in, as a simple explanation as well. I don't know if people come across this really interesting book um, written by Fergus uh, Shanahan. It's a recent book. It's called The Language of Illness. Um, and again, there's a link there when, you, um, when we send you the slides to podcast podcast on a video but I really liked what he said in the in the opener of the book and it's, it's a really greatly explains sort of language it's around the conversations between the patients and doctors are the basis we know this of effective healthcare. um but you know doctors and this isn't just doctors it's obviously nurses or medical practitioners of all you know tend to use disease words and we speak in illness language so again it's trying to you know trying to just be think about how we're saying things and the words that we're using Using plain English, again, we run whole day sessions on this, but so, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you some tips here for you to take away. Um, I have some lovely links there to some really good resources that we have. The, the writing and design tips booklet is really good. Um, but again, simple things like watch out for capitals, line spacing, font type and size and whatever um, are really can be very useful. And in fact, we often come away from some of the sessions and people, I remember doing a whole three and a half hour session once and we finished it. And one of the registrars from one of the things said, I said, what are you going to do now when you're finished? He said, I'm changing my font. Oh, I said, that's marvellous. I'm really happy that you're changing your font. But I also hope you did take some of my other tips away as well. Um, but, it, you know, again, it is interesting. People don't think these things, they, they can make a difference. Plain numbers, again, uh, you know, we could be here all day trying to tease a bit of this out, but just be really conscious that we do struggle with um, measurement is a great example for this. So again, uh, in the back of a Delore light, if anyone has to take it, it might say something like, um, dissolve this in a pint of water. Um, what's a pint does people have? So we've had great chats in pharmacies around how they explain what, have you a pint glass? I don't, I use this, I use that. So it, just being really conscious, not making assumptions, I think is a really important one. Plain speaking, 
So this probably is one of the key pieces um, of takeaway, really, and a lot of people are using this, and it's really important, is around this check for understanding. And, you know, that two-way conversation, I'm explaining something, and what do I do? And what you really do is you use teach back. Um, and again, lots of um, people in this profession have been taught this over their um, communication skills, but it, it is really what's teach back. Again, the Americans, they've done research, it takes two minutes. It's asking the person to explain to you what you're going to do what, or what instruction you have given them. So if it's in, and I've had numerous pharmacists say, I couldn't be asking that. And I says, but you can. So you, you tell them what they do and then you just finish with, so Helen, tell me what you're going to do when you go home with those tablets now. And I'm going to say, oh, well, when I go home now, um, you were telling me that I have to take food with the new tablet I'm on, that blue looking thing. So I'm going to go home, have my dinner and I'll take that with food. And I take it every day at the exact same time, but I must eat with it. You know, great. So it's just asking them to explain back in your own words. And there's a nice little video there. Link again, if anyone wants to have a look when we send the slides. And finally, then the whole Ask Me Three, this is a really good campaign that was run in America um, and we put it into a little credit card size, but it's, it's twofold. We're asking medical and healthcare practitioners to don't let someone out of your um, consultation without them knowing the answers to these. And while we're waiting for everyone to be up to speed as patients, if I'm in an appointment, I'm not going to leave my GP without knowing the answer to these. So what is my main problem? Fine, I have a chest infection. Um, what do I need to do? I need to take um, the tablets um, and I need to take them with food. Just a and why? And the third one is so important. Why do I need to take that tablet with food? Well, I need, and why do I need to take it to get well? With food is because it's a particular type of antibiotic that if I don't um, take it with food, it can uh, irritate the lining of my stomach and I could get an ulcer. So just that extra piece of information, the why, can really make sure that people adhere to taking their medication. And we have, a, a again, there's another sheet there, um, an explanatory sheet, and these are just sort of a summary points around what I've been talking about. And the useful resources that, again, are in this, there's the um, HICWA, there's the HSE guidelines, the cultural guide, and there's another guide as well that you'll be able to have a look at with a lot more detail. Because there, I appreciate, look at the time we're after running, so there's a lot in this that I'm sort of whizzing through, and um, that if we were together in a room, we'd spend a lot more time teasing out. Um, and I suppose I am conscious now, well done, we still have 80 with us. Um, I know we had about 90 something there at one point. So if people would like and have a few minutes to spare, we'd really like for you to go into a breakout group now and have a look at these two questions really um, uh, between yourselves and just type them up as Fergus will explain now, um, even for a few minutes. And if you don't, don't worry and we appreciate your time and we'll be sending you on the information and all the slides afterwards. Um, okay. Or was there anything that you thought your own setting could do to become more literacy friendly? And there's no, that's fine. Like if it's, there's no takers for any of it. And we have it on the Padlet. That's absolutely fine. Just wanted to check with people and give an opportunity. So I suppose really it's then, is there any questions? And if anyone has any, they can stick them in the chat. And um, they don't have to unmute. Um, or use cameras at all, that's absolutely fine if they do have questions, people. So why people are maybe thinking about that and typing it in, I suppose in conclusion, we have um, sort of four points to leave you with. Um, one being that I hope you took from today that health literacy is an essential skill for life, um, for us all really, and that we all develop and maintain that throughout our lives. And it's not just about the individual and the person, it's about a range of responses needed, that's the personal and the practice to the policy as well. And that delivering a sort of and being more literacy aware and delivering literacy friendly um, service really will mean a better health service for everybody. As was the final one that probably didn't dwell too much on, um, but I will just say it again, just for yourself and all of us in our in dealing with health services ourselves, um, as everyone does, we're all is just to ask that question. You know, no question's a silly question. It's your health. It's the most important thing, um, and to always ask that question. And I'm sure from the delivery side to encourage people to ask that question. So again, don't say to someone, do you have a question now? Because that's a closed answer, yes or no, I'm the patient, oh, I don't know. Instead, you might say to them, what would you like to ask me? 
So you're you're leaving it open there for the person that if they had that question, then they might just hopefully um, say it to you and, and ask what's in on their mind. All my details are here and I'm happy to take any um, questions. People can ring me, my phone number is there, but also my email with further information. And then there's, at the end of the things, there's a couple of slides with some information, like a fact sheet, um, the writing and design tips again. I have a couple of nice videos there for people to listen to. Um, again, if you know anyone with literacy supports, I mentioned briefly the adult literacy service. So again, just to say that there you know, are free courses all over the country delivered by the local ETBs. We support people through distance learning service. And again, we've supported people with health information. And we have a nice website there as well for um, parents with ideas to help their children. And then there's other ways, the final, final slide is that just really sharing the information today would be great with your colleagues and the slides on my presentation, if you think it would be useful and just using plain English where you can. And if you would like to join NALA, there's a membership link there as well. And um, that's it, Fergus, really, if, unless anyone has any questions, we're happy that we've done it all in just, just over the hour, because I think we started about um, four minutes past. So that's, that's a good goal. Thanks a million, Helen. A fantastic presentation, really. And I can see from the chat there, a lot of people have said really interesting, great session, Take, took a lot of learning from that. So thanks very much, Helen. Thanks, Aoife. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in and contributing. And we hope you got something far from it and that you can make one or two small changes in your workplace yourself or convince some of your colleagues to make some changes. So. Thanks again. As we said, we will put the video of this webinar onto the NALI YouTube channel and I'll send out Helen's presentation to everybody. And um, we'll be, if any of your colleagues are interested, you can tell your colleagues we're repeating this webinar on the Wednesday, the 2nd of June from 1 to 2. So all the best. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Fergus. Bye.